113 Questions About Evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 21. Can a species de-evolve? Before I start in today, I just want to remind viewers that if you have a question about evolution, you can submit it on the Stated Clearly website, statedclearly.com forward slash contact. And over there, there's a contact form. I do have quite a few there that I've already had submitted to me, and it's going to take me a while to get through them. But yeah, that's that's where that's how you submit a question. So today's question comes from Jessica, and Jessica writes, John, if evolution is a thing, is devolution a thing? Can a species de-evolve? For example, could a population of great apes evolve back into small-bodied, long-tailed, monkey-like animals? Your friend, Jessica. It's actually kind of two questions. One one question is, could apes, you know, evolve into these long-tailed, small-bodied uh, creatures? So maybe a population of chimpanzees, for example. Could chimpanzees evolve tails and become smaller over evolutionary time? The answer to that is yes, that could definitely happen. There's no reason why it couldn't. Uh, would we call that devolution or de-evolution? The answer to that is no. And the reason for that is kind of just... Uh, because that's not what, what we call it. <laughs> I guess we could have called it that if we wanted to, but a lot of science educators have decided that calling it that causes a lot of confusion and sort of <laughs> promotes a misconception about evolution. And that misconception is that evolution is a progressive thing. It's, it's goal-oriented so that somehow things want to evolve to be more complex or more like modern organisms uh, we were somehow on a trajectory to become human, for example, is one of these uh, these misconceptions that the concept of de-evolution or devolution ends up promoting. I'm probably showing my true colors a little bit too strongly this week because I think this is the third week in a row, maybe it's just the second week in a row that I've mentioned Star Trek, but there's a really funny episode of Star Trek where they talk about de-evolution. So yeah, it's, it's season seven, episode 19, I think. That's what I wrote down in my notes. So there's a virus and it starts making everybody's turned off genes turn back on and they start turning into different types of organisms from their evolutionary history. So here's Counselor Troy turning into like a frog type thing, an amphibian. Here's uh, Commander Riker turning into a a hominin, an early hominin. And then we've got one of the guys transformed into a spider for some reason. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, the best thing is that Data's cat evolves into an iguana. I guess the people in the, the makeup department got tired of doing their jobs. They're like, uh, we'll just we'll just turn the cat into an iguana. Pretty much every biology teacher hates this episode of Star Trek. But I should actually do a whole episode on it because there's actually some kind of cool concepts that you can use this episode for things like atavisms and uh, what is it that a virus can do? Can viruses activate latent genes or like turned off genes? And what would happen if that did occur? So there's, there's lots of cool things you can talk about with this. But yeah, the devolution, de evolution is really popular in science fiction, but it's sort of wrongheaded to think this way. It didn't really have to be that way though. I mean, we it could have been that scientists decided to really hold on to the term. They could have used it as a word that defines the loss of a complex trait over evolutionary time. That could have been described as de-evolution. Or the return to an ancestral-like phenotype. That could have been described as de-evolution. So what you would describe, Jessica, as this uh, this evolution of chimps or, you know, great apes into a monkey-like phenotype, that could have been something that scientists officially called devolution. But it's just historically, that's not what happened. Historically, people got upset with the confusion that this graphic causes, actually, and other like older ideas about the superiority of humans to other animals. So there is this really difficult thing in our culture that biology teachers have to constantly fight against. And that is this idea that there's a, a march of progress, that evolution is some sort of a march of progress. And this graphic, which is a very famous graphic, is one of the things that accidentally promoted this idea. This graphic suggests 
that there was some sort of a destiny to become human. And that's not the case. Things just evolve. And things can evolve to become more complex or less complex. It's just evolution. This is just how evolution works. And in the case of you know humans and, and chimps, for example, well, our chimp-like ancestor that we evolved from, it's not necessarily that we're more complex than that chimp-like ancestor. We're just different than that ancestor. It's kind of hard to say whether or not we're more complex or less complex. So, yeah, scientists don't like to use the word devolve or de-evolution because it promotes this idea that evolution is, is progressive. And so you can actually go backwards in evolution. That's not something that people like to promote. So we don't use these words. Instead, the loss of a complex trait over evolutionary time, we call that a loss of function or a loss of function mutation. And then the return to an ancestral-like phenotype. There's different ways to describe that. One is, is called taxic atavism. And you could also just call it convergent evolution. So a group could, through convergent evolution, rediscover a phenotype, so a body form that's somewhat, at least superficially, similar to the body form of one of its ancestors. So yeah, scientists have different words to describe what you are describing as devolution or de-evolution. And here's a really cool paper, Less is More. Natural loss of function mutation is a strategy for adaptation. And it talks about this is one way that uh, adaptation can occur. One way to think about why a loss of a function can sometimes actually be adaptive. It can help an organism better survive and reproduce. Is just to think about, you know, a soldier coming back from war. During a war, your helmet and your gun and your boots and all that stuff, those things are really useful. But if you're just trying to get a job at a grocery store, you know, carrying around a giant gun is going to be, it's going to make it hard for you to get that job. So as environments change, sometimes really complex adaptations suddenly become useless and you actually benefit by losing them. So loss of function mutations end up being adaptive all the time in evolution. And there's a really, really cool example of this actually in humans. So check this out. This is a HeLa cell, and these cells come from a woman named Henrietta Lacks. She had cervical cancer, and these cells were removed from that tumor. And human cells are really hard to keep alive in cell culture. But for reasons that I'm not going to go into here, her tumor cells were really good at surviving in Petri dishes. And because of that, they started being sold as cells to do experiments on, human cells that people can do experiments on in the lab. It's unethical, usually, to do experiments on living humans. So yeah. here we've got a bunch of cells, human cells, and we can do experiments on those cells and learn a lot about human cell biology from these cells. And so these are really popular cells that are used in laboratories all over the world. There's a lot of controversy over this because Henrietta was not informed that her cells were being sold. But here's a different type of imaging where we can see the same cells. This is, uh, we're, we're doing fluorescent imaging, which the blue here is the nucleus and the green are the, the filaments. All of these are HeLa cells. Different types of imaging of the same types of HeLa cells. And here we have another electron microscope image. This shows us the three-dimensional structure of the cells. This used to be one HeLa cell that just recently split in two. Above it here, I have the name Helocyton gartleri, which is a proposed species name for these cells. And the reason that some people say that we should, we should consider this, these HeLa cells to be their own species is because they have evolved so much in the laboratory that they will actually infect petri dishes where they were not supposed to be. And so they can actually spread and reproduce on their own inside of a unique environment. I mean, it's the, it's the environment of the laboratory, but that is their specific niche or niche that they have evolved to survive inside of. And so some people say, we need to consider this to be a brand new species of organism. I, I really like that idea. I think we should consider this to be its own new species. This would be an example of what scientists would call loss of function evolution. 
but I think it's really cool. I do not like the name that they chose for it. First of all, it ignores Henrietta, and it also hides the actual genus that it came from, which we are the genus Homo, Homo sapiens, right? So I think that we should actually call it Homo Henrietta. If I were naming it, I would call it Homo Henrietta. But yes, I do agree. We should consider this to be its own unique species. I think this is awesome. So there you go, Jessica. Is devolution a thing? No, it's not officially a thing. It's not the term that scientists use, but loss of function adaptations are certainly a thing. Next question.